At the age of 12, my ambition was to be a gangster. To me, being a wise guy was better than being president of the United States. To be a wise guy was to own the world. This is Henry Hill. Henry spent half his life running with one of the most violent mafia gangs in America, having to do whatever was asked of him to survive. His life in the mob was made infamous by Martin Scorsese's gangster classic, Goodfellas. Goodfellas is widely regarded as the most unflinching portrayal of life in the mafia ever made. And this scene of a brutal mob slaying actually happened in front of Henry Hill. What Henry witnessed will haunt him for the rest of his life. He used to turn my fucking stomach, you know. And I, I, I mean, I lived in fear every fucking day of my life. But Henry's real life in the mob was far more vicious than Goodfellas could ever portray. It's extraordinary. I don't know what kind of a person it makes you become. I was fucked. I was literally fucked, you know what I mean? And where the movie ends, the darkest part of Henry's life began. That's when life really became insane. In a bid to save his own life, Henry became a government informant and betrayed his childhood friends. The Mafia issued a multi-million dollar contract on his life. They were not going to take this lying down. They were going to look for Henry, and they were going to look to have him executed. It's not a way to live. I mean, he might as well be dead. This is the whole story of Henry Hill, told by the few that survived. Why I'm still here, why I'm around. Heck, I don't know. I got those guardian angels on my shoulder, some, you know, for some reason. This is Pine Street, Brooklyn, New York, childhood home to Henry Hill. During the 1950s, this was a thriving, tight-knit immigrant community. It was a middle-class, blue-collar neighborhood. You know, everybody knew everybody on the fucking block, and uh, you know, they knew everybody's cousins and uncles and where the fuck they came from. Henry was one of seven siblings born to an Italian mother and a hard-working Irish father. I felt out of place at home, and I was always getting in trouble with my father. I mean, I could never do the right fucking thing. He would do things that would invoke the anger of my father. He used to kick this shit out of me all fucking time. And, uh, but I deserved that, you know, I, I mean, I really did. I mean, sometimes he used to do it to spite him, you know what I mean? Just to fucking spite him. Henry felt equally distanced at school, where undiagnosed learning difficulties gave him an outsider status. Dyslexia, hyperactivity, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, these weren't diagnosed. They thought I was a fucking goof off, you know what I mean? They thought I, that I was doing it on purpose. I mean, I couldn't fucking read. It would have been a rare person who would have risen above those things. And Henry wasn't that rare person. There were elements uh, in his family life that were problems with his father. And I think, uh, to a certain extent, he looked for his father to other men, men who behaved differently. When a cab stand run by Paul Vario, a high-ranking member of a mob family, opened across the street, Henry was transfixed. Across the street from my house, you know, with the fucking Cadillacs and diamond rings and the fucking wads of hundred dollar bills and bimbos on each arm and, you know, I mean, it was, it was intoxicating. For whatever reason, I guess because of Henry's charm, they, uh, they took a shine towards him. And they patted me on a fucking back and gave me fucking fives and tens and that day, you know, you know, in the 50s, that was a lot of fucking money. He became a member of the crew, just as the movie shows, when he was when he was a young kid. At 13, I was making more money than most of the grown-ups in the neighborhood. I mean, I had more money than I could spend. I had it all. One day, one day, some of the kids from the neighborhood carried my mother's groceries all the way home. You know why? It was out of respect. Behind him, an inferno erupts, uh, as if he's in hell, basically, because that's where he's going, ultimately. When he first started earning money and he would try to give gifts to my mother and my father, they would never be accepted, not one dollar. So he would try to demean, well, I make more in a week than you make all year, you know, during a holdup or robbery or whatever. These things broke my parents' heart. I thought it was a fucking game, you know, here, take this fucking pistol, shoot, shoot a fucking window a couple of times, you know? 
fucking, I mean, it was exciting. You know, it was, it was intoxicating. Henry didn't realize he was becoming involved in one of the New York Mafia's most violent crews run by Paul Vario, a capo or captain in the Lucchese crime family. He treated me better than he treated his own sons. I mean, I love the guy, you know what I mean? I, you know, I did. Paul Vario was probably one of the most frightening people I've ever been around. He had an aura of menace about him that was quite remarkable, but the Paul Sorvino characterization didn't pick it up at all. In Goodfellas, Paul Vario was played by Paul Sorvino. The portrayal was of a brooding fatherly figure. In reality, Vario was capable of acts of brutal violence. It was on these streets that Vario would reveal his true nature to an impressionable Henry Hill. Must have been 13, 12, 13 years old, and took the fucking baseball bat out of the back of the fucking car, walks in the fucking bar, and I could see it, you know, from where I was. And he starts hitting the fucking barmaid with this fucking baseball bat. I mean, beating the shit out of this fucking woman, you know, broke a fucking collarbone. She she ratted on him that he was going out with it, you know, to his fucking wife or some bullshit. You know, it was just you know stupid shit like that. But I mean, fucking holy fuck, was you know I I never seen that part of him, you know at that you know at that point, you know. And then I start to realize, you know, these fucking guys are fucking gangsters. Yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, but you know, I kind of knew when I you know I didn't want to know. I knew when I didn't want to know. You know what I mean? I didn't want to see it. Sometimes I had to see it. You know. Once I crossed that line as a kid, I didn't want to go back. I was spoiled, I was greedy. Uh, you know, I you know, I think back sometimes, you know, why, you know, why why did I stay? Through Paul Vario, Henry would befriend Jimmy Burke, a gangster far more unstable and psychotic than Goodfellas could ever show. The film actually kind of softened him up. I wouldn't want to see what he was capable of. <laughs> you put it that way. Together, they would pull off an audacious heist that would finally earn Henry the underworld respect he craved. It's my fucking, it's, it's my payday, you know? This is Henry Hill. His early life in the Mafia was the basis for Martin Scorsese's gangster classic, Goodfellas. You know, it's very hard for people in that world to make a straight living. It's very hard for them to do it. Um, uh, it's, like, it's like an addiction. Craving money and power, a teenage Henry Hill had chosen to run with one of the most violent mafia gangs in New York, run by Paul Vario, a capo in the Lucchese crime family. It's a very evil environment where people are concerned about what their next score is going to be and whether they're going to get killed. Through Vario, Hill would meet two of the most psychotic gangsters in New York, far more brutal than the movie could ever portray. Tommy was just a fucking boost horse, a fucking homicidal fucking maniac. While showing Henry the path to underworld respect, they would entrench him in a violent life that he would never escape. Every fucking day I was asked to do a little bit more than I did yesterday, you know what I mean? And uh, they were just sucking me in, you know? Not, you know, but I mean, you know, I, I just didn't know the word no, you know what I mean? Whatever I was asked to do, I did. Sensing his inevitable fate, Hill made his first of two ultimately doomed attempts to escape the clutches of the Mafia. I figured, fuck it, you know, let me join the army. Maybe these fucking people will leave me the fuck alone, you know what I mean? On June the 11th, 1960, Henry Hill joined the US paratroopers stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 500 miles away from Vario's crew. It was sort of a feeble attempt that he would make periodically throughout his life to distance himself from this, this gangster way of life. I don't know, maybe I was bored with that fucking shit, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I was ready to move on in my life and didn't know how. However, Henry's life of crime was already far too ingrained. It's very hard for people in that world to live what you would say a, a more straight existence. I got in a lot of trouble in the army. I had a couple court marshals. Uh, you know, drinking and just fucking carrying on fighting the Marines. He started to resume some of his criminal activities that he learned in Brooklyn, such as gambling, shylocking. He was lending people money. After spending two months in a military stockade for fighting and stealing a sheriff's car, Private Hill was discharged from the US Army. 
when he had a bad run with the Army, he went back to the welcoming arms of the Vario crew, and he found a home there. It was right there, you know, and they, they all was glad to see me come home, and, you know, then it was, then it was a lot different, you know what I mean? Then it was, it was, it was the real fucking deal. Henry's return to Mafia life was sealed when he met Jimmy Burke, played by Robert De Niro in Goodfellas. However, De Niro didn't portray the true brutality of the real Jimmy Burke. He was a maniac. He was a fucking maniac. And people knew that they couldn't cross that fucking line with him. You crossed that fucking line with him, you were dead. And you didn't get a second chance. You know, he'd, he'd just you to fucking death, you know, take you to dinner and then fucking kill you, you know, for dessert. I mean, that's, that was Jimmy. With his fearsome reputation, Burke was Hill's ticket to money and underworld respect. Somebody like Jimmy the Gent was a terrific mentor. He would teach you how to pull burglaries, robberies, big holdups, how to deal in cocaine, how to deal in heroin. He knew the ropes. No matter what it was, I mean, if it was fucking dealing in stocks and bonds or fucking uh, uh, or hijacking a truck or fucking whacking somebody, you know what I mean? Jimmy, he had the answers, period. In the Mafia, the key to respect was earning big money, and Jimmy Burke showed Henry the way when he introduced him to JFK Airport. When Burke was finally arrested, he was flying in a plane over JFK Airport, and he looked down, he smiled, he said, one day all that was mine. By the early 1960s, over $30 billion worth of freight was passing through Kennedy Airport every year. Burke taught Hill the art of hijacking the cargo. Jimmy's main thing was hijacking trucks out of the airport. Sometimes we'd steal two fucking trucks, three trucks a fucking day out of there. You know, and we had warehouses, and we had fucking forklifts, and we had fucking, I mean, we had it down to a fucking science. Hijacking airport cargo had become such a problem that the US government made a film warning freight companies of the Mafia's activities. The hijackers easily ply their trade and too often successfully avoid apprehension. Sergeant, I just lost one of my trucks in Brooklyn. The film was too little, too late. The Mafia already had a vice-like grip over the airport, with people at every level on the payroll. We had the fucking shop stores, the fucking, you know, the bosses of the fucking union. You know, they were fucked. It was all connected. I mean, the drivers knew they were getting hijacked. The hijackers knew the drivers. Sometimes they're even related. And those who couldn't be bribed were forced into silence through intimidation. They got away with it because people were afraid. People were terrified. They were literally fucked, yeah, seriously. <laughs> they didn't, well, what do you get killed? You know what I mean? They find them in the fucking trunk of a car somewhere. Once Hill had mastered the art of hijacking trucks, Burke helped him plan a heist that made him in the eyes of the Mafia. It was a major deal, and I think that in that sense, Henry earned respect. In 1968, Hill learned through an airport insider that half a million dollars in cash was being stored at the Air France depot at Kennedy Airport. But there was a problem. Hill informed his mentor, Jimmy Burke, about a straight-shooting guard who stood in between them and the cash. Together, they hatched a plan to relieve the guard of his keys. The way they did it, they spent many weeks uh, looking over the, the, the guy who was in charge of this operation and found out what his weaknesses were. And as I recall, uh, his weakness was pornography and prostitutes. After getting the guard very drunk, Hill and Burke drove him to a motel where the hooker they had hired was waiting. Because the guard hasn't a clue. And he takes his pants off, and then so, of course, boom, they pull the keys, make a copy of the key, put the keys back in the guy's pants. Now, he goes back to work the next day, but they have the key to the Air France safe. On the 8th of April, 1968, Henry Hill stole over $400,000 from Air France. He couldn't even fucking carry the fucking suitcases out. <laughs> I mean, it was uh, clean as a whistle, you know? The Air France heist was headline news. Obeying Mafia law, Henry split the hall with the Vario crew. There is no greater gift you can give one of those guys than a half a million dollars in stolen money. Money talks in that business, and if Henry was going out and sharing the loot with, with others, then they were going to respect him. I mean, that just sealed it, you know. I mean, no matter where the fuck I went, you know, they were just, you know, fucking red carpet for me too, you know. 
The Air France job earned Henry the underworld respect he had craved since adolescence. And with respect came the keys to the city. We could do any fucking thing we wanted to do in that whole fucking city. I mean, we owned the city. I mean, we were princes of the city. We were. No matter where the fuck we went. He can go anywhere. It's like a magic carpet. You just go anywhere he wants. You know, you can fly through the world. Henry showcased his newfound wealth at the notorious mob hangout, the Copacabana. To be able to go to the Copacabana, this was a major, uh, major height of, I think, sophistication. Go sit down at the fucking table in the Copa, and Sammy Davis come over and sit down, have drinks with you, snatch it, come over to the fucking table before he was there, you know? I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was fucking wild, it was chaotic. Henry was riding high. But when he met Karen, played by Lorraine Bracco in Goodfellas, he was forced to question his mobster lifestyle. She didn't know what I did in the beginning. You know, she knew that, you know, I kind of, you know, I thought I was a, a union delegate, you know. And she was apart from that world that I was in with. Henry and Karen married and moved to this leafy suburb in Long Island. Now Henry made his final attempt to escape the clutches of the Vario crew. It was another way of trying to fucking, you know, insulate myself from those fucking lunatics that, you know, that, that I was partners with and, you know, hung, hung with, uh, you know. And... Desperate to become legitimate, Henry bought The Suite, a supper club in Queens, New York. It looked for a moment like he might actually become a restaurateur and a bar owner. That lasted just a matter of months. He, he just couldn't, he, he was drawn back in. He just fucking followed me, you know. And the place, you know, the place thrived and became a fucking headquarters. Within months, the suite was a mob hangout full of the people Henry had tried to escape. One of the regulars was Tommy De Simeone, played by Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. Tommy was just a fucking loose horse, a fucking homicidal fucking maniac, you know. The film actually fucking, you know, uh, kind of softened him up. It gave him enjoyment to break somebody's wrists, uh, murder somebody, beat him up with a bat. Yeah, he, he was actually a psycho, and then he, you know, he, he was fucking strung out on coke constantly. Tommy would end Henry's attempt to go legit by committing a savage murder inside his club. One night, it was really late, and a, a guy by the name of Billy Batts was in there. He was a made organized crime figure, very important kind of guy. Jimmy and Tommy just fucking beat his fucking head in. We had a, you know, there was an area where we had a slave floor, you know, and Tommy beat him so fucking hard that the pistol fell apart. You understand? Yeah. In Goodfellas, the hit was over a petty argument, but in reality, this vicious murder was over an ongoing turf war. There was a beast story there that never was shown in Goodfellas. Billy Batts had just come home from prison. He had all the Sherlock business there, the bookmaking business. And Jimmy, you know, when he was away, Jimmy took it all over, basically. And Jimmy knew he had to kill him eventually. They cross a line that, unfortunately, is just no coming back, and somebody's going to have to pay for it. Billy Batts was a made man, a fully initiated member of the Mafia. The penalty for killing a made man was death. To ensure the body was never found, they threw Bats into the trunk of Hill's car and drove to Pennsylvania to dig his grave. On the journey, Hill made a chilling discovery. Bats wasn't dead. It was sickening. It was fucking sickening. It was actually sickening, you know? And then we opened the fucking trunk and, you know, he looked at me and he says, Henry, you know, and he just backed the fuck up, and, you know? They, they didn't actually shoot him. They just fucking time just stabbed him 30 or 40 fucking times. Fucking horrible. That ended Henry's ever being able to walk away. It was over. I mean, the suite was gone. Uh, he was now the participant in a homicide. And uh, his bond now was to those with whom he had done the homicide. I was always there to do what I had to do. But yet, you know, it used to turn my fucking stomach, you know. And I, I, I mean, I lived in fear every fucking day of my life. You know, I, 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 I did, you know, I mean, I, I, I was no, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I didn't like the violence involved, you know, but, you know, I, if I showed any sign of weakness, I know I'd get fucking killed. Henry's dreams of escaping were over. 
He was back working in Vario's crew, having to do whatever was asked of him to survive. In 1972, a seemingly innocuous trip to Florida would result in his first incarceration. Ultimately, they just do one thing too many, and they think they're going to get away with it, and they're not. He and Jimmy uh, went down to Florida to pick up some money that was owed. There was somebody had had uh, owed a lot of money to some organized crime guys. And we snatched them out of the fucking bar and uh, beat the fuck out of them, you know, smacked the shit out of them, pistol whipped them. My recollection is that we later found out the facts of that case and that they had chained somebody behind a car and dragged them for <laughs> a good a good space. And uh, But to Henry, that was just smacking somebody around a little bit. He paid the fucking money the next day. But his sister worked for the FBI. We didn't know that. On November the 3rd, 1972, following a successful FBI investigation, Henry and Jimmy Burke each received 10 years in federal prison on charges of interstate gambling and assault. Fucking, you know, no big fucking deal. You know, 10 years, I'll do six years, you know. I still be a young guy when I got out, sure enough. You know, then fucking prison was a fucking joke. You know, it, when you think of prison, you get pictures okay. in your mind of all those old movies with rows and rows of guys behind bars. But it wasn't like that for wise guys. It really wasn't that bad, except that I missed Jimmy. He was doing his time in Atlanta. Benny, give me two steaks while you're in there, all right, John? Sure enough, she goes in a I mean, everybody else in the joint was doing real time, all mixed together, living like pigs. But we lived alone. We give the impression of it being breezier than it was. To add to the irony of it, with the music that's playing and that sort of thing and getting the lobsters. But this was what we, we had guards who told us this is the reality too. I mean, it was all there. It's all there. I mean, there's certain people who were privileged. Hill's privileges were paid for by bribing the guards and that meant earning on the inside. Hill turned to fellow inmate Paul Mazzi who showed him how much money could be made dealing narcotics. They used to joke to us, you fucking stupid fucks, you fucking around with trailer trucks, we'll fucking give you two shoeboxes full of fucking heroin, and it's 10 times as much money as you make off 10 fucking trailers. You know, it sounds like a pretty fucking good idea. That starts to eat away, and money always corrupts. Um, corrupts the corrupted. It was a turning point for Henry. By selling narcotics, Hill was breaking a sacred mafia edict that was punishable by death. The reason that they have the edict is not because they have any moral compunctions about the use of narcotics or selling narcotics. It's because the experience going back to the 50s and 60s is that drug dealers turn on the higher-ups, and, and the higher-ups in the, in the organized crime families wanted to ensure they wouldn't be the, uh, the victims of their underlings who got caught selling drugs. It was, uh, it was too easy, you know what I mean? Henry was now concealing his part in Billy Bat's death and his drug dealing from his mob bosses, and he was getting hooked on the drugs he was secretly selling. The high life was slipping away. I was fucked. I was literally fucked, you know what I mean? Mere months after his release from prison, Hill would become involved in the biggest cash robbery ever committed on American soil. That's when life really became insane. What should have been his defining moment would mutate into an orgy of violence, murder, and ultimately, betrayal. I was a dead man walking, and I knew it. By the time Henry Hill was released from prison, his life in the Mafia was spiraling out of control. That's when life really became insane. He had been involved in the execution of initiated Mafia member Billy Batts and had started dealing drugs. He knew when the Mafia finally found out, he was a dead man. They were going to kill me. Or kill my wife, or kill my kids. And in 1978, Hill and Mafia mentor Jimmy Burke pulled off the notorious Lufthansa heist, a robbery that spawned a vicious killing spree and ultimately led to Henry Hill's cold-hearted betrayal of the mob. You didn't get me, motherfucker. No, I got you. On Sunday the 11th of December 1978, Jimmy Burke's crew, acting on a tip-off from Henry Hill, pulled off the largest cash robbery ever committed on American soil. Five heavily armed and masked men the day fled with an estimated $3 million in cash and $300,000 in jewelry from the Lufthansa Airlines cargo hangar at New York's Kennedy Airport. The robbery was front-page news across America. 
the actual figure stolen would rise to $5 million in cash and a $1 million in jewels. The news of the robbery was not only on the radio, but it was television. Of course, the tabloids uh, splashed it across the front page, and uh, it, was, it was huge news. Everybody in the fucking city knew it was us. The whole fucking... I mean, there wasn't a wise guy that didn't know that we didn't do it. You know what I mean? And the fucking feds knew it, too. Within a day or two, uh, law enforcement knew for sure, based on what their informants were telling them, that it was Jimmy Burke's crew that had carried out the robbery. The FBI's first breakthrough was the discovery of the van used in the robbery, driven by Stax Edwards. He was supposed to get rid of the fucking van, and they found his fucking fingerprints on it. Before the FBI could interrogate Stax, Burke had him executed. The killing spree had begun. It was very hard to develop evidence in the Lufthansa case because people who were involved started turning up dead. The FBI put the entire Vario crew under surveillance. It wasn't long before they started giving themselves away by showing off their newfound wealth. Stupid, I mean, guys with fucking IQs of, uh, you know, 26 are fucking going and buy fucking new Cadillacs, fucking $40,000 mink coats and shit. And little by little, the men who showed off that they had the money were killed. He just tried to eliminate everybody. And he had to, because people were going fucking nuts. Fucking three month period, 12 fucking guys, and one wife, they found torso off. Out of the fucking, rolled up on a fucking beach in Rockaway. One of them wound up getting killed and hung up in an ice truck, and he was frozen stiff. It took three days from the body to thaw so they could give it an autopsy. I can remember one in particular who we brought into the strike force told him that the FBI had informant information that he was going to be killed. And he listened politely and uh, looked at both of us and said, can I go? And he did, and he walked out, and his body parts washed up several weeks later. Within months, Jimmy Burke, with Paul Vario's blessing, had slaughtered everyone involved in the heist. Henry Hill was the last man standing. I seen the handwriting on a fucking wall. You know, I didn't have no way out. You know, I mean, I was fucked. I was literally fucked, you know what I mean? Henry knew Jimmy wanted him dead. He had to find a way out. You know, from, you know, from having fucking life, you know, on Easy Street, you know, with open, you know, three or four restaurants, like, I got a fucking million dollars cash, you know, I ain't had to launder it. You know, open a few restaurants. Now I'm in the fucking heroin business. Throughout the Lufthansa killing spree, Henry had become heavily involved in narcotics trafficking. He knew that his mafia boss, Paul Vario, would order his death if he ever got caught. We knew he was uh, involved in uh, the sale and distribution of heroin, cocaine, quaaludes, any number of different illegal drugs. Hill's drug dealing had attracted the attention of the Nassau County Police Department, who placed him under surveillance. With Vario, Burke, the FBI, and the police closing in, amazingly, he would find a way to make his problems even worse. Very quickly, he began to snort heroin, uh, became addicted to heroin, became addicted to cocaine, and um, uh, his judgment was pretty cloudy in those days. He wound up putting a lot of drugs out on the street and didn't get paid for it. Couldn't remember who, half the time, who we gave what to. I got so fucking wacky on drugs. I mean, not wacky, I mean, I was able to function, but I was, you know, strung out on, you fucking name it, I was strung out on it. The anxiety and the pressure that he's feeling, I think are really so evident, uh, the way Scorsese shot the scene. I was gonna be busy all day. I had to drop off some guns at Jimmy's to match some silencers he had gotten. I had to pick up my brother at the hospital and drive him back to the house for dinner that night. And then I had to pick up some new Pittsburgh stuff for Lois to fly down to some customers I had near Atlanta. They got more and more out of control. <laughs> you know, there's no way it's gonna get, it's gonna slamming up against the wall. Everything's gonna crash. Oh, fuck, I mean, it was totally fucking insane. Totally fucking insane. He had eluded us in so many different directions, and um, I was ready for it to be over. Finally, after 41 days of surveillance, Nassau County Police Department swooped and arrested Henry Hill. 
the little fucking lights went on, and the fucking, you know, the blue lights and the red lights, and fuck, I was, fuck, oh, God, you know. He got caught. He got caught. The guy who thought he would never get caught, they'll get you. Henry was taken in for questioning, but the police hadn't found any drugs. The stroke of luck they were looking for came in the shape of Henry's girlfriend and drug partner's relaxed approach to domestic hygiene. They went in the fucking house and fucking vacuum cleaned the fucking walls, all this fucking heroin and coke. <laughs> they said you could stay hard for a fucking year just for the shit that was on the wallpaper, you know. And I said, gotcha. With overwhelming evidence against him, Henry Hill was facing 25 years to life in prison. And he was a marked man. His drug dealing meant Vario wanted him dead. And former friend Jimmy Burke knew that as the last man alive with inside knowledge of the Lufthansa heist, Henry could lead the feds to his door. Nobody at that point had any faith that Henry was going to keep his mouth shut. I knew Paul was going to whack me, Jimmy was going to whack me, you know. It was, it, was, it, it was so fucking crazy, you know. He could have counted the days before he was killed. But the FBI offered Henry a way out. In return for his inside information on the Lufthansa heist, he would receive immunity on the drugs charges. So he was an easy case. I mean, he was facing five, seven life sentences. Henry had no option but to break the most important mafia rule of all. Never rat on your friends. He loathed himself for having turned because his entire life had been based uh, in a world where becoming a rat is the worst thing you could possibly be. I was becoming a rat, you know what I mean? I'm fucking slew pigeon. And, you know, I mean, I just couldn't even fantasize, you know. I would, there, there was a time in my life that I would have put a fucking gun in my fucking mouth and, you know, blew my fucking brains out before I'd become a fucking rat, you know what I mean? On the 22nd of May, 1980, Henry Hill agreed to cooperate with the FBI. This is where the movie Goodfellas ends, but where a 25-year mafia manhunt and Henry's descent into self-destruction began. Hill and his family were moved by the US Marshals to Omaha, Nebraska, to begin their new lives in the Witness Protection Program. The first night he was in the program and lying in his house in absolute silence in the dark, he said, he said, I was scared out of my mind. Not that the guys from New York were gonna, gonna come get me. It's, it's, I can't do this normal thing. <laughs> it was a culture shock. I mean, it, seriously, it was. They chewed a backer and they spit, you know what I mean? Oh. And they talk fucking funny, you know what I mean? They, they do, I mean, it's like a different country. Henry had to assume a new identity that would enable him to travel back to New York to begin his debriefing. He chose Martin Lewis, insurance adjuster. I'd be gone all the time. I'm investigating an arson in fucking Boston and, you know, this and that, you know. And they, they fucking believe me, you know. In New York, Hill began his debriefing about the Lufthansa robbery so the FBI could finally get to Jimmy Burke and Paul Vario. But his free-roaming testimony inadvertently incriminated other Mafia members. You know, I just told the fucking truth, and every time I told the truth, it opened another fucking can of worms, and, you know, and it started another investigation and another fucking case, and I had no idea that this was going on. We were able to make some significant cases and develop all sorts of other evidence that uh, led to uh, other investigations and prosecutions. You know, and then I said, well, you know, you, you gotta go on a stand. And I said, no, 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 I, 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 didn't, I didn't make that fucking deal with you guys. Well, you don't want to fucking stand, you know? Hill was forced to take the witness stand and come face to face with the Mafia bosses he was betraying. It was tough. I mean, looking at these fucking guys, you know what I mean? These bosses of bosses and shit, you know? They were absolutely the highest quality uh, uh, targets that we had uh, in the most difficult cases that we had, and Henry was, was an extraordinarily valuable witness. He did his job for the feds. I mean, he, he, he showed up in the courts in New York, came back, 
many times and was invaluable in breaking down a huge uh, gang empire in, in New York. Henry's testimony helped convict over 50 mafia members. They were not going to take this lying down. They were going to look for Henry, and they were going to look to have him executed. Back in Omaha, Henry began to spiral out of control. Part of him wanted to mess up and punish himself, so he was becoming extremely self-destructive. I couldn't live with myself. I mean, I, you know, I just, you know, I should take a bottle of Stolies and fucking drink it every night, you know what I mean? He was a, a, a total coke freak, a pill freak. A, I mean, he was on everything that he could take. He would ingest anything. In between trials, the FBI was continuing to debrief Hill about Lufthansa, as he was the last surviving witness. We were running through the robbery and where he was during the robbery, and Henry said, well, I was in Pittsburgh. Ed or I said, well, what were you doing in Pittsburgh? And Henry kind of smiled his little smile and said, well, you're not going to like this. Three years before his arrest, Henry Hill and Jimmy Burke were fixing basketball games at Boston College, ironically the team Ed McDonald used to play for. I said, you know, you're completely nuts. I said, you got a real serious problem here. Motherfucker almost leaped over the fucking table. He tried to grab me, but <laughs> he went berserk. Together, Burke and Hill had bribed three players to fix the results of basketball games, including starting center Rick Kuhn, who was dragged in front of the US courts. With Kuhn and Hill's testimony, the FBI could finally bring Burke to trial. Burke was arrested. Suspected of murdering at least 50 people, the mastermind of the Lufthansa robbery would face trial on a seemingly innocuous gambling scam. And on the 27th of October, 1981, began the US versus Jimmy Burke. The courtroom was packed with media, with organized crime figures, and with people who were interested in the case. Henry Hill would once again have to take the stand, this time against his former mafia mentor. I felt like a fucker. I mean, I had a look at him, you know, but I knew that this motherfucker ordered my death, you know what I mean? Before the trial, the FBI played Hill wiretap evidence of Burke ordering his execution. I didn't believe him, you know what I mean? And they played me the fucking tape. I mean, in which they shouldn't have, you know what I mean? When the cops like, I ordered my death, you know what I mean? The whack him. I mean, you know, that... I mean, that's, that's, that's what it became, you know what I mean? Henry was ruthless. I mean, he was a cornered rat. And uh, while he might have been uncomfortable testifying against these people, uh, he recognized that these people were looking to kill him. I was able to look the cocksucker in the eye, you know what I mean? I said, Jimmy, you didn't get me, motherfucker. No, I got you. Jimmy Burke was convicted and would spend the rest of his life in prison. At the end, at the end, I was just, you know, disposable. I was just, you know... They were going to kill me. Hill's testimony would be equally damaging to Paul Vario on trial for extortion at Kennedy Airport. Put his fucking head down. You know, fuck you, we didn't kill you, you cocksucker. You, you got us. Yeah, I got you. Motherfucker, you know, you'd have got my wife and my fucking kids, motherfucker. You know what I mean? I, I knew what they were capable of. You know, I mean, I seen it all my life growing up. Henry's testimony helped convict Paul Vario. He was sentenced to a total of 12 and a half years in Pittsburgh Federal Penitentiary. Behind bars, Jimmy Burke organized a relentless campaign to have Hill found and executed. He would have been uh, just mutilated uh, for what he had done. Henry Hill would spend the next 25 years running for his life. In 1980, Henry Hill became a government informant, betraying his childhood friends Jimmy Burke and Paul Vario, condemning them to spend the rest of their lives behind bars. I beat them to the punch. You know what I mean? I did. Burke had issued a multi-million dollar contract on Henry Hill's life. There would be plenty of takers. They were going to kill me. Or kill my wife, or kill my kids, or, you know, I mean, anything to get to me. They would all love to make their bones killing Henry Hill. Henry Hill had been secretly moved to Omaha, Nebraska and placed in the witness protection program to safeguard him 
from Mafia reprisals. They looked out for me. I mean, they knew what the fuck it was. It was a big fucking deal back in 1980, you know. Being a rat, you know, I mean, I was the first fucking <laughs> guy, you know. He was clearly um, in, in a great deal of danger. His family was in a great deal of danger. In 1981, through a government informant, the FBI received the news they had been dreading. Burke was closing in. Burke had somebody that told him where Henry was allegedly at. They notified us that we don't take chances. We moved him out. Phone rang. Show some clothes in your fucking bag. We'll be there. We're outside right now. I believe he had about 24 hours. Gotta go. Throughout the 80s, Hill and his family were moved repeatedly by the US government. The threat of mafia execution was ever present. He was in a great deal of danger, and this contributed in many ways to uh, his alcoholism and his drug addiction. He became highly addicted to cocaine and heroin and you name it. And Henry's drug addiction was about to lead him into the arms of the Mafia. In the mid-1980s, Henry Hill had been moved to Washington. With a serious addiction and mounting debts, he returned to his life of narcotics dealing. And in Washington, Hill fell foul of an undercover police sting. I knew the guy was a fucking cop the minute I met him. You know what I mean? I, you know, he was a fucking agent. I knew it. And I couldn't convince these other fucking assholes. You know, and they dealt with him. I got popped. Henry Hill was arrested on narcotics charges. Worse still, he had lost his witness protection status through seven years of continually breaking every rule in the program. The witness protection program failed, in my view, for Henry, because Henry is a weak person. Um, he wasn't able to, uh, to discipline himself and to, uh, to change his life. Passing bad checks and uh, uh, calling home back to New York, you know, which was a no-no, that was forbidden. Don't use the phone, go fuck yourself, you know what I mean? Fuck out of here. It's not so much that the program failed Henry as that Henry failed himself. And his usefulness for the government at that point was pretty much at an end. He had already given up everything he had to offer to uh, negotiate. He had nothing left. It was a strong case. He went to trial. He was convicted. Things couldn't have been worse for Hill. Awaiting sentencing, he was sent to Terminal Island in California, a prison populated with Mafia inmates. When he arrived, he found out that there were members of the East Coast Mafia who, were, who knew who he was and what he had done to their guys back east. They were doing time there, you know. They were doing life sentences and fucking 20 years and all this other fucking shit. Well, they, they tried to kill me. Two attempts were made on Hill's life. And though his usefulness to the government was over, Ed McDonald came to his rescue one last time. I wrote a letter because I thought it was only fair to talk about the, uh, the convictions and the cases that he had contributed to. The judge waved the letter in front of the prosecutor and said that uh, because of what Henry had done and because of the pressures that he was under, uh, he was going to sentence him to a probationary sentence. I had to do another year in drug rehab and they sent me to this fucking you know, place where I, you know, supposedly got rehabilitated. <laughs> Finally, Hill received some good news. Wise Guy, his autobiography, coded with Nick Pileggi, was to be made into a Hollywood movie. Scorsese called me. He wants to do the movie. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, he's gonna give you half a million dollars. I said, yeah, okay. Not a fucking payday, you know. I mean, seriously, I have a fucking million. Henry had to work hard for his money. Robert De Niro constantly phoned him for advice on how to perfect his portrayal of Jimmy Burke. Ironically, the man who wanted Henry dead. He's on the fucking phone constantly. I mean, you know, like fucking seven, eight times a day. He wouldn't leave his fucking trail without talking to me twice. You know, Jimmy needed it. How did Jimmy hold his cigarette? How, yeah, I thought he was a fucking nut job. When filming had finished and De Niro had left Henry alone, he was smuggled onto the Warner Brothers lot for a secret screening of Goodfellas. I mean, how, how could you imagine yourself, you know, on a fucking big silver screen, you know what I mean? And, uh, and it was me, you know what I mean? It, 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 this fucking kid nailed it. I, I had a lot of fun. I had, you know, I had a lot of money and all that fucking, you know, insane fucking shit. But yet, 
at the end of the fucking night, you know, I still with a pistol in my fucking pillow. Throughout the making of Goodfellas, the threats on Hill's life and his life on the run continued. But the main threat ended on the 13th of April 1996, when Jimmy Burke died of lung cancer in prison. It was a fucking relief, you know what I mean? And the same with Paulie when he died. You know, it was a fucking relief because I knew, well, Paulie Hannah wouldn't kill me. You know what I mean? Paulie wouldn't kill me. But I knew Jimmy, Jimmy, you know, on his fucking deadbed, I'm sure that he said, yeah, make sure you get fucking Henry. You know what I mean? I knew Jimmy. When Burke died, that was the end of the fear of New York. But that was far from the end of his problems. Today, Henry Hill lives in the Midwest. He and Karen are divorced. The money from Goodfellas is spent and he makes a living as a chef in a small Italian restaurant. For the most part, he never breaks a promise unless it has to do with um, alcohol. And if it has to do with alcohol, he'll break it. I'll, I'll say this to this fucking moment. I mean, you know, I don't like being sober. I don't. I've heard him that many times. All I really want to be from here on out is the best damn drunk in the world. He is plagued by his addictions and haunted by his former life. Living a lifestyle where he lived by a code and broke it, uh, I'm sure came into it. He also continues his life of crime. This last deal, he goes through the security at the airport with drugs in his carry-on bag. I mean, how dumb is that? I think what you see of Henry today is what you'll see of him the rest of his life. He'll be in and out of trouble. I don't believe he could ever turn his back on it. Is it possible that Henry will find redemption and walk the straight and narrow? Um, you know, stranger things have happened. He's getting near the end now. Uh, and it's quite possible that as he looks at his final days, he might get religion, but I wouldn't bet on it. I'm on, I'm on borrowed time, and I'm happy. I, you know, I am. Believe it or not, I mean, as fucking sick as it sounds, you know, and as fucked up as my life was and is and is going to be, you know, probably the fucking day I die. But I don't hurt nobody anymore, you know what I mean? And I don't hurt. <laughs> 